Pali has a single word, dukkha, that covers a lot of words in English. This can create problems for a translator, but also created problems for the Buddha, that he had to distinguish between different kinds of dukkha. And he had to combat the tendency to glom them all together. As he said, our basic reaction to dukkha, pain, suffering, stress, whether it's physical pain or mental pain, is bewilderment on the one hand, and a search. Is there someone who knows a way or two for the cessation of this dukkha, this pain? When we first asked that question, when we were little children, we're probably thinking primarily of physical pain, but it's glommed together with mental pain. And the Buddha is basically offering his teachings as a response to that question, but he refines it. On the one hand, he raises the bar, usually when we're concerned about a pain, we're bewildered about a pain. It's that particular pain, and all we're thinking about is the cessation of that particular pain. But he's offering something more, a way to stop the suffering from any pains we may have in the present, but also to attain a dimension where there is no possibility of any further pain at all. And he found that strategically it would be important to focus not so much on the physical pain, but on the mental component, both the mental pain and the mental cause of the pain. And this is where the strategy of the Dharma as a whole begins. That's why the practice begins with the Four Noble Truths, not with the three characteristics. And the simple fact that there are are things that arise and pass away that are dependent on conditions, fabrications. And there's a stress inherent in the fact that those things are dependent on conditions and they're inconstant. That's not the beginning of the practice. It's a fact that's out there. But the practice begins when you focus instead on a particular type of suffering, a particular type of dukkha, the dukkha that's the same as clinging and it's caused by craving. And as you learn how to get past that craving, you not only put an end to whatever mental suffering there is around, say, physical pain or other mental pains, but ultimately you get the mind to a point where it's not creating the conditions for any further fabrications at all. When for the arhat the senses all grow cold, and there's a total unbinding. There is no possibility for pain in there at all. So the Buddha is taking this very basic question, can somebody help me, basically is what the question is saying. And it's a social question. It's because we suffer, because we have pain, that we're actually interested in other beings at all. If we had no pain, if everything was just bliss, 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 we probably wouldn't be concerned about other people or interested. We just be totally consumed with the bliss. But the fact that we have pain means we start searching outside. As children, we search for our parents, help from them. As we grow up, we search for help from other people. And the Buddha is offering himself as the ideal person to give advice. Because for a lot of us, that search is tainted by the bewilderment that also goes along with pain. The path of practice begins when you get some handle on where the pain is coming from, what the pain is, and what you can do about it. That's right view, the Four Noble Truths. So that's the beginning of the practice. That's really the beginning of the Dharma. And everything we do as we practice virtue, concentration, discernment, develop all the 
perfections is based on that understanding. It's because we realize that the pain that is metal and the causes of the pain that are metal are the really important ones. That's why we're sitting here meditating. If pain were caused by situations outside, the kind of pain that, that we can put an end to, or if the strategy involved focusing on the causes outside, we wouldn't be sitting here with our eyes closed. We'd be out there agitating, get things changed outside. You know, the causes are right here. The solution is right here. The problem is right here. The end of the problem is right here. So focus right here. We got the mind quiet so that we can see the mind. The mind has so many things going on. It's like a corporation. Big building with lots of people. And for the most part, like any corporation, nobody really knows everything that's going on. And so things that are important, things that are unimportant, all get glommed together. What we're trying to do is get things really, really quiet so we can see what's important, where the clinging is, where the craving is. So we got the mind quiet, not just for the sake of the pleasure that comes with the quiet. We're going to be using that pleasure to counterbalance the pleasure we get in the different kinds of craving. So allow your mind to settle in. Both to rest and to get ready for work. If you're coming to the meditation frazzled from the day, it can take a lot of time to give a sense of well-being right here. Breathe in ways that feel good. So it feels good just simply inhabiting the body. This is called the pleasure of form. It's different from the pleasure of sensuality. The pleasure of sensuality depends on things outside being a certain way. And they almost never really correspond to our desires. As the Buddha said, we'd have to rain gold coins, and it still wouldn't be enough for our desires. So here, obviously, it's not raining gold coins. Another time he said that you take the Himalayan range and you double it and turn it all into gold. It still wouldn't be enough. For one person's sensual desires. So out there, there's never going to be enough. So you look for a different kind of pleasure, the pleasure of form, that's simply inhabiting the body from within in such a way that if there's any pleasure that comes from the breath, you allow it to spread through the body. Any pleasure that comes from the way you conceive the breath, that that's spread through the body. So the whole sense of the body is saturated with a sense of well-being. This is part of the path. It was the first part that the Buddha discovered, right concentration. And once he followed right concentration to the point where he understood the Four Noble Truths, in other words, finally developed right view, that's when the path was complete. And we said, as I said earlier, that that's where the Dharma really began. So we're right on the way here. We're in the right spot. So we can develop that sense of well-being that will counteract the causes of suffering. And then we can see, see them more clearly, those causes. The Buddha said that any craving that leads to becoming is going to be a cause for suffering. So you want to notice what little becomings appear in the mind. 
For the time being, we're working on one big becoming inside, which is this sense of inhabiting the body from within. Then anything else, you've got to call into question. All those messages that are sent back and forth in the, in the corporation, all the little spats and the politics of the corporation. You want to catch sight of them and to see how they create suffering in the mind. So everything else is not related to the breath right now. Call it into question. And sometimes calling it into question just simply is noticing that the mind might be inclined to go in a particular direction. You say, why? What's accomplished? And that's enough to stop. Other times it's not enough. The mind feels more and more inclined, or part of the mind feels more inclined to go someplace else. And you have to reflect on the drawbacks. If you thought that thought, what would it accomplish? Where would it lead you? We have this tendency to be fascinated by all our thoughts, to side with whatever, whatever thought comes up in the mind. And you have to change the, the alliances, change your allegiance. The well, mind is a complex thing. This is why our suffering bewilders us, because it's coming out of a complex cause. But the Buddha says you can trace things in such a way that you can get rid of a lot of the complexity. Because a lot of it comes from a simple lack of discernment, our tendency to glom things together. He says when you learn how to see things as separate, that's when the discernment really is doing its work. So the big separation line right now is between focusing on the breath and focusing on anything else that's not related to the breath. And hold on right here. Try to make the breath, or your sensation of the breath, fill the body as much as you can. If you can't fill the breath in the body, or the, breaths, the subtle breath of sensations in the body, focus on the sensations that you can feel and make them comfortable. There's this tendency, reading of John Lee's instructions on breath, to get really fascinated by his descriptions of the breath energies in the body and to neglect what he has to say about the rhythm of the breath. In long, out long, in short, out short, in short, out long, in long, out short. And notice how the rhythm of the breathing has an effect. And that can, can occupy you for a whole hour if you want. Whatever gets you interested in inhabiting the body from within, so you can change the balance of power inside, and put the mind in a position where it can really do the work at the point where the work needs to be done, inside. So make this a good place to work. Make things clear inside. Because everything you need to know is right here. It's simply that we've allowed it to become murky, where everything gets glommed together. Physical pain, mental pain, the pain of the three characteristics, the pain of the four noble truths. It's all one big sticky mess in most people's minds. But when you allow things to settle down inside, you begin to give yourself a chance to separate things out. So you can put your finger on the cause. And then really do something about it. <laughs>